Let's get started with the, uh, the last panel we have for today. And so if Professor Hamamoto had a difficult task of keeping you awake after uh, lunch, my task is even more difficult because I will have to guide you through the final panel. Uh, for that, I will keep my own remarks to a minimum and let the speakers talk because I saw that some of them had quite a few slides. Uh, nevertheless, um, I, I urge the speakers to stick to 20 minutes. Uh, once it's about 20 minutes, I will start knocking on my microphone so you will hear <laughs> that there is something wrong and you should speed up a little bit. Um, but I think... Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, I will have some help as well. Uh, but. Uh, I think that we move into the last session in a, a topic which I believe uh, should uh, gather some attention in the sense that uh, when I was writing my own PhD and I, I'm, I always think that it was still yesterday but unfortunately this has been in 1988, so quite a long time ago and at that time when I wrote my PhD on the Arctic uh, there was nobody who was really interested in the topic because it was the Cold War. Uh, nothing was moving there, and so the, uh, one could raise the question why even uh, start to look into the legal issues in that area. I don't have to tell you that today, of course, the situation totally changed and that the Arctic from the back burner has become a very much to the forefront of international attention. And that's why I think we have the great honor to have three uh, speakers, top-notch speakers once again, here for the last panel. Uh, we try to find somebody from uh, Nordic countries, certainly. So we have somebody from Canada, somebody from Russia, and somebody from in between, which is Norway. Uh, <laughs> and, and they all will touch upon the issue uh, of the, uh, from the general to the more detailed. And that's why we have the, uh, uh, we will follow the the, the order of the program uh, that we have. So I will first uh, give the floor uh, to Professor Fife. Um, I'm not going, going to tell them or tell you what, what they have done. They're all very knowledgeable in Arctic matters and of course it's sufficient for you to read the, their bios that you all have received. After that we will give the floor to Professor Gavrilov. Uh, Professor Fife will talk about the general introduction. It will be on the application of the law of the sea in the Arctic uh, basic methodology. Then we will move into a, uh, a more limited and specific issue, namely the continental shelf. And of course, Professor Gavrilov will tell us about the, uh, the Russian submissions uh, and Russian uh, position with respect to all this, but it's more general. It also covers the other countries in the Arctic. And then finally, we'll have a, uh, a national approach, uh, and that will be the issues that Canada has with respect to Arctic matters, and they all will be touching upon, because that's the topic of this conference of dispute settlement. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor now to our first speaker, and that is Ambassador Fife. 20 minutes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you to Hélène and to Eric for the invitation, for the great organization, all your staff, co-workers. It's been fantastic. I just have one word of criticism. It's exhaustive and exhausting. <laughs> and uh, so uh, from the depth of my heart, thank you to all of you who still survived and still here uh, and are listening to us. Uh, it's uh, uh, a fascinating subject, but it's late in the day. Uh, I, I think, uh, basically, uh, we celebrated on Monday, uh, I think, the, uh, on the 25th, the Gapchikovo Najimarosh uh, judgment, which was seminal, seminal in the true meaning of the world, meaning planting the seeds of something that has been growing since. So it's not uh, a judgment that provides a response to any questions that may arise, but it's a seminal event. If I could, uh, tongue-in-cheek, try to destabilize uh, your views about the Arctic and dispute resolution in the Arctic, etc. I'd like to uh, say that we should celebrate on Thursday, on the 28th of September, the Truman Proclamation. Because the Truman Proclamation, uh, well, 28th of September 1945, if the analogy to Gapshikovo Najimarosh was that uh, that particular case arose in the wake of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the uh, restructuring of Europe and uh, the acceptance of uh, use of dispute resolution mechanisms uh, to a new extent, 
Um, well, but you could say that uh, the Truman Proclamation came just in the wake of the Second World War, and uh, an effort, uh, I understand it, from the United States to uh, privately consult with a number of states, and uh, that uh, proclamation applied to the Arctic. Let it be no mistake. The first time sovereign rights were staked out with regard to the continental shelf, that was done also with respect to the Arctic. I, I speak under the control of Bernie Oxman, uh, Sean Murphy and others, but I stand to be corrected. Please do not uh, forget that um, about half of the coastlines of the US in terms of length are in Alaska, if I'm not totally mistaken. So this is important. Now, I was invited and I thought of Simon and Garfunkel. I was thinking of the wording, uh, when you're wary, I mean you said between Canada and Russia, when you're wary, feeling small, when tears are in your eyes, I'd rather them all. How do you do that? Uh, according to Simon Garfunkel, I seem to remember I'm, not, I'm on your side or when times get rough and friends just can't be found, like a bridge of troubled water, I will lay me down. Now this is, I think, entirely accurate to describe dispute resolution in the Arctic. I see no troubled waters. I wonder if it's a sunset or whatever it is, but the future is bright. <laughs> uh, what is my point? I started my Truman Proclamation. It's basically by saying that uh, contrary to what some people might have said, in, even our distinguished um, a moderator who referred to the situation in 1988, with all due respect seen from Brussels, nothing had been happening in the Arctic, seen from Oslo, the situation was somewhat different. Uh, we tend to, uh, at least those of us who have gray hair, uh, have, have the tendency of looking back to history and uh, feeling somewhat proud of the fact that some of the very first seminal events that influenced major developments that became general international law actually stemmed from the Arctic. I mean, I could be very boring, but, uh, and there are many specialists in this room, but please do remember the 1893 Arbitral Award for the Bering Sea uh, and the issue of preservation of fur seals. I mean, we're speaking early, big time, issues of conservation and uh, the budding start of a process which was followed up by the uh, 1911 Convention, uh, fur seals, which took more of a multilateral nature. Uh, the examples, there are quite a few of them. Uh, I would go beyond that and basically say, uh, when was the first ever dispute resolution by a standing international court concerning territorial sovereignty as such? Not a border or boundary issue, but, you know, the beef, territorial sovereignty as such. Well, the issue was the Eastern Greenland case, 1933, and uh, Professor Trevis, you, we had the discussion this morning uh, about uh, various uh, uh, traditions around the world, but please do not forget that the president of the PCIJ in 1933 was Mr. Adachi, a great guy, among other things, ambassador to Paris. I think that's an entirely uh, <laughs> relevant, relevant uh, qualification. Um, but uh, a, a great diplomat, a great international lawyers, and the PCIJ included a magnificently uh, qualified uh, uh, Chinese lawyer, uh, Judge Wang. So uh, please do not enter into the realm of thinking that whatever happened with the first world court, so to speak, uh, was a proto-global, uh, uh, meaning European kind of endeavor. It was much more than that. And uh, the 1933 uh, Eastern Greenland judgment is being referred to. It's, uh, in my uh, view, uh, it's being um, uh, sent around the world. Uh, you see it being repeated in the Eritrea Yemen arbitral award. Of course, we are at the antipodes. The thermometer scales are totally turned upside down. It's pretty hot in the Red Sea. It's pretty cold in Eastern Greenland, but the point is the same. In hospitable areas, how do you consider issue of uh, acquisition of territorial sovereignty. The list can be made much longer. Um, of course, the 1951 uh, Anglo-Norwegian fisheries case uh, was based on the uh, assessment of a royal decree adopted uh, whose geographical area application started with the Arctic Circle and went beyond. And of course, that referred also to the intricate interrelationship between activities on land and at sea within those particular internal waters 
uh, within uh, the straight baselines that were established. Meaning something interesting between the lines that there are Arctics and Arctics. There is an Arctic region, yes, but there are different Arctic realities depending on whether you have had uh, a process of uh, warming up of your coasts and maritime spaces stemming from the Gulf Stream and the Gulf of Mexico, to whom we are <laughs> extremely grateful in Norway, or whether you, you come from uh, the northwestern territories of Canada. The, the, the situation is somewhat different in terms of weather. There's been a huge degree of uh, uh, human activities and how you integrate the various uh, activities and uh, reconcile uh, issues. And when you reconcile issues, you sometimes have to deal with dispute settlement. So I would go beyond that and basically say that um, if you uh, add the list of uh, uh, dispute resolutions that have been put into place and su successfully brought to the fore in the Arctic area in general, you will find a number of seminal uh, decisions that have been uh, key to later developments. I would add to the list, we heard this morning about the conciliation mechanism relating to Iceland and Mayan. That's north of the Arctic Circle. That was the Elliot Richardson-led uh, conciliation commission. Uh, a particular kind of mechanism, but still stemming from the high north. Uh, remember also that just off the coast of eastern Greenland, I mentioned 1933, uh, you have waters with the island of Yarmayan, and the 1993 judgment of the ICJ concerning maritime delineation, I think, provides uh, with a 14 against one uh, 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 vote, and uh, the contents uh, and obiter dicta and dispositif, you will, you will see, uh, 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 you know, a, 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 a key element in the building of a jurisprudence. And here we come to one of my main uh, uh, philosophical uh, basic methodology like uh, messages or, or theses. And that is that we have not seen in the Arctic the emergence of what I would call a, fragment, uh, a, a contribution to fragmentation of international law, the emergence of a regional law. Uh, and if you consider what has been happening in academic debates in the last few years after flag planting, after melting of ice, and discussions about whether Article 234 of the UN Convention of the Sea is sufficient or not sufficient, relevant or irrelevant today as ice is melting, I would say that basically that's a pretty artificial discussion in my view, because if you look at what has been happening, there's been a huge uh, series of developments whereby what has been happening in the Arctic has been a contribution to development, unity and universality of international law and of dispute settlement mechanisms. Please do not forget that if you look at UNCLOS Article 297, referring to Article 33 of the Charter, as has been mentioned this morning, uh, negotiations are key element, uh, often the preferred way or means of settling disputes. And I think you will find in the Arctic, uh, at least in parts of the Arctic where there have been lots of human activities, contributions to uh, the protection of ecosystems, to uh, the settlement of uh, outstanding delimitation issues and the other uh, issues. The other point I'd like to make is that there is an interesting interaction. I think the academic communities might do well in looking more into that. Uh, what is the role of jurisprudence? I would say jurisprudence does not only settle a particular issue between two or more states, does not only contribute to the building of a uh, potential body of law in the form of jurisprudence, even though the subsidiary means on the Article 38 of the statute of the, of the ICJ. I think in terms, for instance, of maritime delimitation, that the jurisprudence provides extremely helpful guidance to governments when they negotiate. A look at what's best been happening, the convergence of methods, the unified way of dealing with maritime delimitation, exemplified, I think, uh, last Friday in the Ghana Cote d'Ivoire uh, uh, judgment uh, uh, that was delivered at ITLOS, uh, you, you will see that there is, even though there is a flexibility and elasticity and adaptability to different geographical configurations, there is a unity of method. And I think that is a very powerful, powerful message to be uh, uh, sent around. Why is it important? Because I believe, honestly, 
And that's why even though uh, I, I have my main job is to cater for the excellent relations between France and Norway, and uh, Monaco and Norway, the, the question is why do I spend time here? I think because there's a, such a clear nexus, correlation between dispute settlement, international law, and international peace and security, not least when it comes to the issue of boundaries and borders, not least to when it comes to mechanisms for dealing with um, seemingly irreconcilable differences. The way you structure an argument in um, talking to your neighboring states or others is, has a bearing on peace and security. It's not only an issue of whether you can win a case before a tribunal or a court or whatever. So please look at what impact the jurisprudence led by the ICJ, but supported by many other mechanisms, what kind of contribution that has in practice on the behavior of states, I would suggest that we are uh, moving, in spite of certain setbacks and non-appearances sometimes, uh, we're moving in one direction which has been staked out quite clearly. Are there problems in the Arctic? Yes, there are issues in the Arctic. Of course, the main problem is not that one is hunting polar bear, because we have one of the first instruments stemming from the Stockholm Conference in 1972 on uh, uh, the environment was uh, the Polar Convention, uh, which uh, prohibits basically uh, hunting. The problem is the habitat, and the habitat of the ice, uh, polar bear is, of course, intimately related with global climate issues. We see the effects in the Arctic of developments on the global level, so the Paris Accord is a key element in, in, in uh, responding to that challenge. But quite a few other things, adapting to new uh, possibilities of navigation, even though there will still be peak charge conditions during wintertime. Let there be no mistake. I, I, I sometimes meet people who think there's going to be sunshine, tropical palm trees, and uh, you know, it will be pitch dark during wintertime, and you will still have, and you will have much more drift ice than you had previously. So the quality of ice will differ, but you will have hazards for navigation. That's why the process engaged within the IMO with regard to the Polar Code and where the Arctic Council was not the decision-making body, but the cat catalyst for action by the competent international organization. And this is a powerful confirmation of the role of the law of the sea in, in this area. I think it's, it's vital. And I meet too many people, let me be very frank, uh, don't quote me too bluntly, but I'm uh, exhausted by people who basically say, polar code, being there, done that, doesn't work. Uh, it's a framework that needs to be filled with further measures, and it has some dynamic elements that, which deserve to be looked into. So that's the name of the game right now. When you see ship insurers and you see shipyards studying carefully the polar code, uh, polar code sorry, uh, <laughs> As, as the paradigm for competi competitive uh, advantage and access to important waters in the future, I think it's worth to listen to them. So uh, it's not as though we don't have issues in the Arctic, but uh, I would say that uh, Norway, even though we're pos positioned between <laughs> Canada and Russia, and, uh, and have uh, waters which are probably more than many others, uh, or many Arctic states, uh, characterized by the lack of ice, basically, to simplify things. Uh, we uh, represent an example of a state that has uh, utilized all the dispute resolution mechanisms available, primarily negotiations, but we have done conciliation, we have done um, uh, ICJ and, uh, and uh, other kinds of uh, uh, resolutions. So I think we basically uh, have uh, dealt with the, all the delimitation issues uh, at hand. And the interesting feature is that the latest the limitation agreements are not just delimitation agreements. They are also cooperation agreements, implying not only a political signal that you're not building a Berlin Wall or anything like that when you draw a boundary line. You basically clarify the jurisdictional basis for further cooperation across the boundary. So in the case uh, of uh, the agreement or the treaty between Norway and Russia of uh, 2010, it's, I think, 50-50 the limitation line and all the nice elements related to that. On the other hand, it's the preservation of a quite unique fisheries cooperation system, which stemming from the 1970s, 74 to be exact, the first attempt, and uh, codified in 76, 
we looked at, and this was before 20 mile zones were established, and it was an extremely successful case of uh, forward-leaning uh, approaches, we decided to establish the TAC, the total allowable catches, for the whole distribution area for COD, haddock, etc. When I say haddock, the lawyers get interested because they think I say ad hoc. No, I, I, I mean haddock, <laughs> yes. Uh, so so, so the, 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 there are interesting uh, features relating to how uh, one has preserved a very important fish stocks uh, while the situation elsewhere has been sometimes less interesting. So what is my key point? It is to be optimistic. There is a bright future as long as we have good lawyers, enough, uh, enough lawyers and enlightened politicians. So my basic uh, suggestion, uh, Eric, would be to say nothing new under the sun, particularly under the midnight sun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, your enlightening uh, presentation and uh, also for keeping within the time limits. Thanks so much. Uh, may I now give the floor to Professor Gabrilov uh, to talk to us about the continental shelf issue in the Arctic. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my deep gratitude to Eric to Helen and some other organizers because it is honor to be here. Uh, thank you for, very much for your hospitality. This is a very high level conference, very actual content and very high representatives of the people from the different areas and from the different levels, including the academics and, uh, and practitioner. Uh, speaking about my uh, Topic: I would like to say that uh, in recent decades, the situation in the Arctic has changed dramatically, and the global warming has created expectations for economic expansion in the region. The prospect of exploiting Arctic resources has encouraged a discussion on the uncommon struggle between states for gain access there to, including the issue of determination and delimitation of the continental shelf of the Arctic Ocean. In this case, it is especially important not to allow political or military confrontation, but to rely on the rules of international law. This is a recent opinion, given that Arctic Ocean coastal states have so far felt it in their best interest to live up to their law of the sea obligations. The coastal states benefit from following the rules of this, ensure that continental shelf extended far out into the Arctic Ocean basin. As you know, uh, the current legal definition of the continental shelf is given in the Article 76 of the Law of the Sea Convention and represent a complicated legal construction. It has been defined there as a natural prolongation of a land territory to the outer edge of the continental margin or to a distance of 200 nautical miles from the baseline. The convention also has linked the legitimacy of states' actions in the delimitating their shelves to the necessity of receiving recommendations from the Commission on the Limit of the Continental Shelf, CLCS, which is final and binding for all. At the same time, in Article 83.1, Law of the Sea now, Convention excluded from the scope of its control cases of delimitation of the continental shelf between states with opposite or adjacent costs and entitled them to decide them for themselves by concluding agreements in order to achieve an equitable solution. All of this has created a new legal and institutional reality in the Arctic Ocean seabed delimitation, which encourages states to cooperate each other and requires that the outer limits of the continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles are approved by the CLCS. As of today, the delimitation uh, lines of shells of adjacent uh, Arctic states have been completely legally established only with respect to the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean and the Barents Sea. In the agreement between the Denmark and Canada of 1973 and Norway and Denmark on 2006, as well as in two Russian Norwegian agreements of 2007 and 2010. The delineation in the Eastern Arctic Ocean uh, still has not received proper legal registration 
It concerns, first of all, the border of the USA and the Canada in the Fourth Sea. Disagreements between the countries originated from the different interpretation of Article 3 of the 1825 Convention between the Great Britain and the Russian Empire concerning their positions in the northwest coast of America. Canada claimed that the boundary should be drawn along the meridian line of the 141st degree of west longitude and should apply for not only the land but also the maritime delimitation. The USA argued that the 1825 convention applied to the land domain only and that the boundary needed to be established in the Beaufort Sea along the equidistant line. However, with respect to the delimitation of the Arctic Shelf beyond 200 nautical miles, neither party has expressed its official position. The reason is that in high latitudes, the equidistant lines between their coasts significantly turn to the west and considerably reduces the area to which the United States of America could possibly lay claim. Such a line becomes as unbeneficial for the USA as it is attractive for it inside 200 nautical miles. As to Canada, the situation is quite the opposite. Despite the existence of the Soviet-American agreement on the maritime boundary of 1990, the process of relative uh, spaces delimitation in the Arctic Ocean also cannot be considered finished, as well as this agreement is being applied on a temporary basis only. According to Article 2 thereof, the Russo-American boundary runs to the north along the 168 degrees 58 minutes west meridian through the Bering Strait and the Chukchi Sea into the Arctic Ocean as far as permitted under international law. It seems to be quite an interesting legal wording because it allows dealing with the location of the terminal point in the Arctic Ocean in many ways. Depending on the stage of the development of the international law, its content and results of the agreements between the engaged state. Despite the presence of these agreements, the final delimitation of the Arctic Ocean Shelf may be legally determined only after the establishment of, the, of its outer limits. The CLCS has a very important position in this process, both in terms of the stimulating effect that it may have on the achievement by the Arctic states, the re relevant agreements, by mere fact of its existence, and in terms of the role that the Commission plays in the uniform application of the criteria provided by Article 76 of the Convention. Russia was the first state to make submission to the CLCS, and I think that this was our great mistake, in 2001. After having undertaken a wide range of additional studies, Russia in August 2015 made a partial revised submission in respect of this continental shelf in the Arctic Ocean. According to the area of continental shelf beyond 200 nautical miles covers almost 1,200,000 square kilometers. That is approximately 100,000 kilometers square kilometers more than in Russia's 2001 submission. The revised submission also provided information on the achievement by Russia of certain agreements with Denmark and Canada, which stipulate inter alia that. Parties do not object to the Commission considering the submissions of each other, and the recommendations of the CLS, CLCS shall be without prejudice, neither to consideration of the other states' submissions, nor to the process of the delimitation of the continental shelf with other states. It is obvious that this understanding provides the CLCS with legal reasons to issue recommendations of the establishment by Russia, Denmark, or Canada of the outer limits of the continental shelf in the Central Arctic Ocean, even with unsettled disagreements and disputes present. It seems to be especially important in the light of the submission made by Denmark in December 2014. Ah, sorry. 2014. 
which significantly overlaps the area included in the Russian submission, namely in the polar region and on the major part of the Lomonosov Ridge. In the submission, German Klee stated that its position contradicts to the positions of the Norway, Canada, and the United States of America. However, these countries do not object to the CLCS considering that submission as well. At first sight, it may seem It may seem that the fact that Russia and Denmark made submissions that clearly contradict each other and that other Arctic states consented to their consideration by the Commission makes no sense. However, it turns out that the Arctic states intentionally make such submissions stipulating the rights of the Commission to consider them even where there are existing potential territorial disputes. According to my point of view, such an approach allows the Arctic states to ob objectively estimate their chances of success, depending on the results of the Commission's assessment of the provided information, and eventually to establish more reasoned position for the future negotiations with, na with their neighbors. It's more than likely that for that very purpose, Russia and Germany concluded special provisions into their submissions, stipulating that they reserve the right to introduce amendments in addition to the CLCS, and that after the Commission issues its recommendation, the final decision of the Arctic Ocean Shelf Delimitation shall be provided in accordance with Article 83 of the Convention. In this regard, the official Canada's submission to the CLCS will also be of considerable importance. As soon as scope of Canada's claims to the Arctic Shelf is known, the limits of intersecting zones in the Arctic Ocean will take shape, forming the basis for negotiations. However, Canada only submitted the required preliminary information in 2013, having revealed the possible inclusion into its continental shelf, the certain areas of of the Canada and Amundsen Basin, Lomonosov and Alpha Regis. Some Canadian scientists estimate that the um, country's extended continental shelf in the Arctic will be three quarters of a million square kilometers. Besides, Canada stated that it would make partial submission to the CLCS concerning the Arctic Ocean at an appropriate date. However, it still has not happened, uh, and I think there are at least two reasons for this. This is my private opinion. First of all, taking into account the submission of Denmark, which lays claim to the part of the shelf north of the Canadian Elsmere Island, it would, be, it would have been more rational to wait for the decision of the Commission on the validity of that position rather than once again stress the existing disagreements between Canada and Denmark by making its own submission to the Commission. And secondly, under conditions of a long-term scientific research of the continental shelf being concluded by Canada together with the United States of America in the Beaufort Sea, and existing disagreements between them on the principles of delimitation, Canada's unilateral submission may decrease trust and increase tension between these two states. Moreover, the lack of clarity concerning the drawing of the western limit um, western limit of Canadian Arctic Shelf makes possible its delimitation from the shelf of the United States beyond 200 nautical miles along the medial line rather than 141st meridian west. In this case, not only Canada and the United States will have a common continental shelf boundary, but Russia and Canada as well. This will create an absolutely different legal reality since Russia still has no agreement with Canada similar to that concluded with the USA in 1990. The foregoing allows coming to the following conclusions. Um, the, process, the process of legal delimitation of the Arctic continental shelf is only beginning to develop. And despite the presence of some agreements concluded by adjacent Arctic states, the problem is still far from being finally resolved because such agreements do not regulate delimitation in the polar area. 
It is because the prospect of territorial delimitation in the Central Arctic Ocean looks more complicated as it will require the delimitation of the shell between not only adjacent but the opposite states. It is further worsened by the lack of sufficient quantity of universally recognized scientific data that could shed some light upon the origin and nature of submarine ridges and rises in the Arctic Ocean and establish their compliance with the requirements of the, of the uh, Article 76 of the Law of the Sea Convention. It means, I think, that attempts of states to unilaterally resolve the problem of the limitation of the Arctic Ocean seabed based on their own vision will still be the keynote of that process in the near future. At the same time, it looks very likely that making submission to the CLC, CLCS or agreeing with the considerating by the Commission of uh, other submissions, the Arctic states are not going to treat future recommendation is final and binding. They refer to Article 83 of the Law of the Sea Convention and look at the Commission like and rather an expert body capable of confirming or discouraging the vision of the shelf delimitation. Moreover, one should not forget that pursuant to Article 8 of Appendix 2nd of the Law of the Sea Convention, in the case of disagreement by the coastal states with the recommendation of the Commission, the coastal states shall make a revised or new submission to the Commission. This process potentially may last forever, since the establishment of the outer limits of the continental shelf is the sovereign right of a state, and the Commission is only entitled to provide recommendation thereon. One should not forget also that the United States of America is not a party of the Law of the Sea Convention, thus not being bound by the provisions of Article 76 thereof, and not being obligated to make a submission to the Commission in order to re receive recommendation on what the outer limits of its continental shelf should be. That is why its relation with the other Arctic states on the issue should be guided by the provisions of the 1958 Geneva Convention of the Continental Shelf or of Article 83 or other articles of the Law of the Sea Convention insofar as they constitute rules of the customary international law confirmed in particular by decisions of international courts and tribunals. All this means that one Arctic state should not treat unilateral submission or statements of other Arctic states as a reason for pessimism and confrontation. They are intended solely, at least I'd like to think so, to outline their starting positions and create a subject for the subsequent international negotiations, format of which may be vary from the parallel bilateral consultation to a full-scale international conference of Arctic states. It means that the problem of delimitation in the Arctic Ocean continental shelf can be finally be resolved only by means of the negotiations, taking into account the, the interest of the, all the involved parties. Thank you. Thank you so, thank you so much, Professor Gavrilov, for your speech. I, I really must have scared my speakers because they all are within their time limits. <laughs> So now I turn the floor to Professor David van der Zwaag, who has quite a few slides, but promised to keep the 20 minutes. Well, being the last speaker, the last session, the last day is not an ideal position. So I'm going to change. I'm not going to give thanks to the organizers. I'm going to give thanks to everyone who's still here, <laughs> and including the organizers, your survivors. So. You may wonder, 42 slides, I was raised from day one on this issue. The reason I have 42 slides is I really want to set a Luxembourg record, maybe an EU record. I already hold the North American record for one of the fastest PowerPoints in history, so I will go very fast with my presentation. And uh, so I'm going to look at five quick disputes, uh, and we'll go over those. And with the Greenland catches of Atlantic salmon, we'll see about that. If I don't have time, I will cut that out, and I'll leave it to PowerPoint copy that you have. So um, there's one dispute, Denmark with Lincoln Sea Boundary. I'm not going to discuss that. OK, sorry. I usually have a pretty loud voice, so you may. 
Okay. So, anyway, uh, you have the one agreement there with uh, Lincoln C. That was agreed to in 2012 informally. They haven't formalized in a treaty yet, so I'm not going to cover that. And the two images that I want to discuss are conflicts and cooperative bridges and then foggy futures. We're really not sure where all these disputes are going to go yet uh, in the future. So we've already heard about the Beaufort Sea, uh, and I'm not going to go into the details again. You do have this difference uh, going back to the old treaty language, how far that boundary, the land boundary, actually does it extend into the ocean or not. Can Canada says it does, US says it doesn't. And so you have that dispute that is still there. And just as a matter of practice, so the US actually has put in place, sorry, uh, <laughs> Basically, you have the U.S. North Pacific Fishery Management Council in 2009 actually uh, put in place a moratorium on fisheries for commercial fisheries over in the Beaufort Sea. It goes over to that equidistance line. Canada, likewise, has done it in practice, too, with its large ocean management area, which is established for integrated planning. They use the uh, 41st Meridian, 141st Meridian as their line. And then you have uh, basically a lot of cooperative bridges that have been established. You have a joint marine con con contingency plan revised in 2013. You actually have Canada matching a USA precautionary moratorium on commercial fisheries in the Beaufort Sea. And you have a co cooperative extended shelf surveying going on over a number of years. You have the uh, Coast Guard Healy, and then you have the uh, uh, Canadian Coast Guard Louis St. Laurent going on a number of years on joint exercise. And the reason you need these icebreakers, they didn't have enough icebreakers themselves. So they had to share the responsibility. And so one icebreaker would go and break the ice, the other one would use the sensitive equipment to, to do the surveying. Uh, so you have that uh, cooperation go on a number of years. Very quickly, the Northwest Passage. I'm almost afraid to talk about it because so much has been said about it already. But Canada maintains, of course, the passage consists of internal waters, and they drew the straight baselines around the uh, archipelago, effective in 1986, January 1. And basically, it's total sovereignty, much like your land territory. And Canada already had way back put in place very strict in, in pollution standards, way above global standards at the time, zero pollution for garbage, zero oil pollution, for example, and special construction crewing standards as well, which I'm not going to go into the details. So two main arguments for supporting that uh, claim. One is historic waters, and I'm not going to go into details of the arguments. And then waters within straight basins drawn around a fringe of islands along the coast. And I'm so glad we have a Norwegian representative because Norway, of course, led the way in this with its drawing of straight baselines back in, in the 1951 fisheries case, of course, you mentioned. And Canada would re re rely on that very much. Um, two arguments can be made against the Canadian draw of straight baselines, of course, under the law of the Sea Convention itself, the islands are not in the immediate vicinity of the coastline. They actually extend probably over a thousand kilometers up. And of course, the other argument is they do not, they, they must not depart from any appreciable extent from the general direction of the coast. If you go back to customary international law, which Norway, basically the court was relying on customary international law, it didn't say about the immediate vicinity of the coast. It was just, you know, basically a, an islands off, a bordering the coast, essentially. So Canada certainly is going to rely on the Norwegian kind of a customary uh, law argument that was made back in 1951. The U.S., of course, and Bernie Oxman knows very well, uh, the position is that uh, the Northwest Passage is an international strait subject to the rights of transit passage by foreign ships, and basically then is very limits of what a coastal state can do to control the shipping. Uh, coastal state cannot impose its own pollution control or safety at sea standards. Coastal state can designate sea lanes and prescribe traffic separation schemes. Uh, necessarily promote the safe passage of ships, but IMO approval is required. And a coastal state cannot prohibit foreign ship transits because of risky cargo, such as hazardous or radioactive waste. Uh, considerable debate has occurred uh, over whether it is an international strait or not, and little question the Northwest Passage, I think, meets the geographical conditions set out in the Law of the Sea Convention, connecting one part of the high seas or an exclusive economic zone with another part of the high seas or EEZ. These are the big questions. What exactly constitutes a legal litmus of navigational usage? Is it potential versus actual? Volume of traffic required, number of different flag vessels. I think we're now over 250 transits that have occurred, so quite a few have occurred by uh, over 190 different vessels, so it's actually quite a bit of volume already. Uh, cooperation again, we have a 1988 agreement between the US and Canada related to this, and they basically 
have an agreement on Arctic cooperation. They said, let's set aside the jurisdictional dispute over the legal status by agreeing to disagree. And the United States agreed that its icebreakers would be subject to Canadian consent for transits within waters claimed by Canada to be internal. And they agreed to share the research information from uh, marine scientific research that might be gained by the transits of the icebreakers. Um, so and certainly exactly what was agreed to, whether well, the U.S. is just agreeing to subject government icebreakers undertaking marine scientific research to the actual consent regime, and quite clear, though, that commercial and naval vessels were not included. Uh, tensions over extent of coastal state special legislative enforcement powers bestowed by Article 234. Um, I don't want to go into the, all the boring details of that language. Uh, it's a long provision. But you can see what it does. It basically provides the coastal states like Russia, Canada, could be Norway, as coastal states to not only legislate but enforce special provisions to protect the marine environment from pollution. So control of marine pollution is key. And then you see some of the limits in ice covering areas, ice covered areas that are covered for most of the year. So obviously this is the ice cover provision, and you have to do, have due regard to navigation. So there hasn't been a full-blown dispute, but various issues continue to surround this practical implementation of Article 234. What exactly does ice covered for most of the year mean? And is the Arctic, uh, article applicable to ice covered straits used for international navigation? I believe it is, and I won't go into detail why. And in, another important issue, can Article 234 be used to justify a unilateral coastal state imposition of ship reporting and possibly routing measures? And this became an issue, actually in 2010, Canada put in place a mandatory vessel reporting system for all these shaded waters here, basically the Arctic waters, for quite a few vessels, your large cargo ships, particularly ships carrying cargoes that are pollutants. Uh, and so it became mandatory then for these ships to report into the Canadian zone before they entered. And a tussle was led by US, Singapore, number of other countries with, before the IMO, and they were questioning whether this system was in compliance with the Safety at Life at Sea Convention, which is at Chapter 5 and regulatory requirements. And the real argument was Canada should have worked through the IMO, the Global Organization for Shipping, to justify uh, the uh, mandatory reporting. And it was not clear that Nordrig really gives due regard to navigation. Cooperation, Canada subsequently sought to bridge the confrontation in, I think, a very diplomatic fashion. fashion. Uh, they submitted an explanatory document of its own to the IMO, clarifying that Article uh, was relying, Canada was relying on Article 234 for its unilateral imposition of the Nordrig, and noting that father, foreign sovereign immune vessels would be requested to voluntarily comply with Nordrig, and requested IMO to bring the Nordrig system to the attention of member governments. And in fact, it actually issued a, cir a, a circular saying, governments be aware that this is what we're doing, so they clarified the situation in a rather cooperative way through the IMO. Dispute over Hans Island very quickly. You have this small island uh, up here between Greenland and Canada. Very small island, less than a kilometer or so in circumference. And uh, both countries have claimed ownership, of course, to the island. And you've had various military and other official visits. And the flags being planted by both countries over the years and ship back to the other countries when they take it down from the other country. And uh, so little of no importance though to offshore jurisdiction. In fact, the 1973 boundary line that was drawn all across the uh, areas there between the countries, um, they just brought it up the line right near Hans Island and started again on the other side. So there's just a very small gap uh, that will have to be dealt with eventually. Cooperation, you have this joint statement on Hans Island back in 2005 saying, let's not escalate, let's escalate the situation anymore. Stop leaving your Canadian whiskey for the uh, you know, Danish Navy. Uh, so it was really kind of def diffused a lot. And you have a lot of cooperation going on, including an agreement on marine environmental cooperation in 1983. And you have actually joint management of narwhal and beluga whales between uh, Greenland and Canada. Greenlandic catching of Atlantic salmon, North American origin off Western Greenland. I want to raise this because I don't think a lot of people are aware of it. And it's Arctic related. It's not really so much uh, Arctic specific. But you do have North American origin salmon, particularly from off of Maine, Nova Scotia, and then going up to Labrador. And they go all the way off to Western Greenland, where they are caught off Western Greenland 
uh, fisheries. And the status of many of these contributing salmon populations might be described as dire. Atlantic salmon U.S. rivers are listed as endangered under the Endangered Species Act and under Canada's uh, Species at Risk Act. All these inner Bay of Fundy down around Nova Scotia are considered endangered. And if you go to eat salmon in Nova Scotia, in Canada, from the Atlantic, it will be Norwegian salmon or it will be farm salmon. It's not your wild salmon that will be eaten in restaurants, for example. So it's a really dire situation in terms of the wild salmon stocks off the Atlantic of uh, North America. And there's a lot of things going on here. You have uh, acidity causing rivers to become very acidic. Uh, warming waters may be causing early smolt migrations. All kinds of things going on no one really totally understands. And conflicts then has arisen over Greenland's uh, continued harvesting of North American salmon, even though the International Council for Exploration of the Seas have continually recommended against a mixed stock fishery off of West Greenland. Cooperation. You have a North Atlantic Salmon Conservation Organization, which began operating in 1984. It's to manage the salmon stocks moving beyond national jurisdictions. You have a West Greenland Commission that regulates the fisheries off Western Greenland. And in 1998, a breakthrough occurred where Greenland agreed to an internal consumption fishery only. They're not going to ship their catches over to European Union countries, for example. It'll all be an uh, internal fishery within Greenland. And they said it's going to be around 20 tons with this quota applying for most years through 2011. In 2012, this began to break down, and Greenland began to authorize factory landing quotas. That began to escalate, go up, and basically the reported catches have gone up, uh, up to close to 60, well, 55.9 tons in 2015. And you're, it's pretty well known that you probably have unreported catches of 10 tons per year. So in 2015 meeting of this NASCO, uh, West Greenland Commission, they could not reach consensus on a regulatory amendment. And Greenland unilaterally said, we're going to set our own quota at uh, no more than 45 tons in 2015, 2016, 2017. And then just this past June, uh, agreement was we need to talk more about this intercessional session, uh, and we really have to seek a new regulatory measure for adoption in 2018. So that's where that sits. Foggy futures. I think I have eight and a half minutes to be exact. Correct? Okay. Are you still with me? I should talk in this maybe a little bit more. But, uh, okay. So foggy futures. Uh, Beaufort Sea boundary, obviously two main ways forward. One is negotiation. That's likely to be what you're going to see eventually. Uh, and I'm not going to go into details. I think most people know why negotiation is preferred. You keep uh, a lot of control and you have the ultimate flexibility, how you're going to resolve it. And, you know, it's really a question, then are you going to draw a single line eventually or lines? Or are you going to do what Norway and uh, Russia Federation did and have more of a cooperative management uh, arrangements? And there are all kinds of things you can do to arrange you know, cross-boundary cooperation. And you can even avoid line drawing with joint development zones, joint fishery zone, a joint marine protected area. And I, every Canadian has to get a polar bear in their presentation. So there's with the polar bear. And so you do have polar bears and belugas, of course, in that area. And one could think of a, a transboundary MPA even in the future. Uh, as we heard already in the previous uh, presentation, uh, you're going to eventually see the uh, extended boundary is issue come up as well. And that equidistance line then actually favor Canadian drawing of a line on extended continental shelf boundary. And both Canada and U.S. has indicated that they're not going to enter into negotiation on the Beaufort Sea boundary until they actually know where that delimitation area is for both countries. It's not clear that actually you have to go to the Commission to do that. You might just do it internally to understand where that is. So it's Time is not uncertain, uh, very uncertain on this. And then, of course, you have the treaty that was mentioned. And again, you know, look at, it's so similar to the Beaufort Sea. You have a, basically a meridian line and then the uh, median line, equidistant line. And they kind of split the difference with Norway and Russia. So some have suggested that's the way ahead with Canada and uh, uh, basically U.S. as well. And you always can see third-party resolution as a backup if needed, but I don't think it's going to go there. Northwest Passage. Uh, Canadian position remains unchanged. In fact, former Prime Minister Harper said we're going to build these uh, Arctic Patrol vessels. In fact, they are being built in Halifax, where I live, and I happen to know that's happening. And uh, vessels capable of patrolling the Northwest Passage during the summer navigable season, able to patrol passes approaches year-round. Very Canadian. 
It's not nuclear submarines. If they met a nuclear submarine, I'm not sure what a patrol vessel would do, but Canada's down this track. Canada did have a statement of Arctic foreign policy issued in 2010, but a previous government gave no clear guidance how the Northwest Passage dispute would be settled. It said, we really want to settle the Beaufort Sea boundary with the U.S. and the Lincoln Sea boundary with Denmark, Greenland, and Prime Minister Trudeau. That's not a selfie. That is a picture, I think, taken by the media at some point in the North. And he's promised a new issue, uh, a new Arctic policy framework, but that has not yet come out. And it's not certain when that policy framework document will come out. But that, again, might give some further discussion where we go with that. And just interestingly, the U.S. Department of Defense, they came out with a new Arctic strategy in 2016, and they actually pledged to preserve the U.S. mobility rights uh, in the Arctic and freedom of navigation, obviously having in mind, I think, Canada and probably Russian Federation as well. And I think it's clear, clear to say President Trump has not paid much policy attention to the Arctic, except for trying to reverse an Obama administration, basically putting a ban on new oil and gas leasing in the large, large parts of the Beaufort Sea and uh, Chukchi Sea. Uh, and political tensions have obviously been elsewhere with the uh, renegotiations of the North American Free Trade Agreement, taking on Rocket Man from North Korea. I mean, all those things have been obviously high priorities, and Arctic has really seen very little attention as far as I can see. So three ways forward in the Northwest Passage. You can have a Canadian submission to U.S. Na uh, US na international straight position. U.S. can recognize a Canadian position. And I think those are both kind of really difficult to see them moving forward on that. And so I think really what we're going to see probably for at least quite a while, unless the U.S. Department of Defense pushes some buttons here, you're going to see the um, basic agreement to disagree continue uh, for quite a while, and maybe forever. Who knows? You have the suggestion we can extend the 1988 Arctic cooperation to cover commercial vessels. There's been a suggestion you could have a counter U.S. Arctic Navigation Commission. And I would just in, kind of end up this part just saying shipping cooperation involving Canada U.S. has in fact greatly expanded. And you actually have Obama and Trudeau had joint meter statements when uh, Obama was still in, in office. And they pledged to cooperate on various shipping uh, approaches, having, inclu including developing safe shipping quarters in the Arctic. U.S. would have its off Alaska be much more safe for ships, and likewise in Canada. Canada do the same in its Northwest Passage area. We've had an Arctic Coast Guard Forum, and the Arctic Council has come up with even new agreements on Arctic search and rescue. We now know if a plane goes down or a ship disaster occurs, who's going to be responsible as first responders, and there's cooperation to kind of quickly across the border to help out if it's needed. Yeah. Conclusion. Okay, I've got three minutes, but okay. Um, and we have new, new polar shipping codes. Hans Island, you can just simply draw a line across it. And Article 234, <laughs> watch this one. Who would have thought that migratory caribou would go across the Northwest Passage? But you can read this document, and now the Inuit are saying, Government of Canada, we want you to put in vessel rooting measures in the Northwest Passage to protect caribou. Not belugas, not the whales, a whole new twist. So watch that one, and what will Canada do, and how will it do it? Keep an eye on it. And then the salmon one, hopefully NASCO will be able to resolve it. And what's interesting, NASCO doesn't have a dispute resolution procedure, so it brings up this whole question, well, maybe you have to go eventually to under the law of the Sea Convention itself. And I won't go into details because of time. And here I am, I think I'm 30 seconds early, actually. But Canada continues to face the article related disputes, and they are, I think it can be described as well-managed. And a mix of formal and informal co-opter bridges have been built. And when and how these disputes will get resolved remains foggy. And really, I think only the political tides will tell. We'll see. So I'll stop. <laughs> when you're jet lagged, by the way, it's a tendency to talk into the <laughs> speaker. OK, thank you very much. For your, uh, uh, for your speech. Um, after all this flow of information, uh, anybody having a question for the last panel? So I would suggest again that we go for a first round. Uh, people wanting to ask questions, please state your name first before uh, raising the issue. Any questions? Well, I, I don't think Rolf Einer FIFA 
uh, mentioned Svalbard, and he must have a reason for not having mentioned it. So if he could explain why he didn't mention it. Any other question before we... All right, then let's go for the answer. Thank you. Um, I'd like to respond to this and also add some comments, if I may, to the excellent panelists. Uh, Svalbard, um, the, all the delimitation issues have been resolved. Um, among the uh, five uh, Arctic states surrounding the central part of the Arctic Ocean, um, Russia was the first to make a submission to the Commission, and I think it was uh, a great step forward in uh, engaging in the dialogue with the Commission, and then, of course, there's been a procedure engaged uh, after that. Uh, we did it in 2006. Uh, in 2009, um, we got, uh, uh, Norway got, um, cleared its, um, its continental shelf um, uh, claims. Uh, Svalbard is part of that, as any other part of Norwegian territory. Uh, there are some, um, uh, there were some questions as to whether Svalbard would have any impact on the negotiations between Norway and Russia as regards the delimitation and cooperation arrangements. Uh, the answer is no. And uh, so basically, the, um, uh, what you are referring to, Michael, in an extremely diplomatic way, is that there are maybe nuances of meaning with regard to interpretation of certain provisions in the 1920 uh, Treaty on Spitsbergen. Um, they are, in my view, relatively prosaic in the sense that they have to do with uh, whether some issues or rules on uh, equal treatment and, and the like are applicable in certain areas or not. Uh, I think, uh, in general terms, um, this gives me an opportunity for saying that uh, when uh, the issues of territorial sovereignty in, uh, in the Arctic boil down to Hans Island, and David has a marvelous way of suggesting a solution, you know, cut it in two or whatever you wanted to, or draw a line through it, it basically goes to say that uh, contrary to some um, views that have been expressed by the media, uh, the Arctic is probably the region in the world that has the less issues of territorial sovereignty. Because if you look at any other uh, regional uh, part of the world, uh, I won't even mention Antarctica, um, there are uh, issues, real issues, of uh, overlapping claims of territory. That is not the case in the Arctic. So I think you could rest assured that that's not uh, an issue of contention among the Arctic states. Now, your marvelous way of expressing how to deal with Hans Island, and of course I could not comment on that, uh, but uh, it seems to me, David, that you also said that when it comes, came to Norway and Russia, we just uh, split, split the difference. I think that's uh, a relatively shortened version of 40 years of negotiation. <laughs> and uh, I think what is useful to this audience is basically to ask what issues or method and what, what was the toolbox that was useful. Because it's not just like adopt uh, the Norwegian-Russian uh, solution uh, or even imagine that it was split in two. Uh, because yes, the, the areas of overlapping claims at the end of the day were adjusted so that it was a 50-50 uh, division in surfaces, but it's not a splitting in two. And I think the answer is basically go back to the jurisprudence of the international courts. Look at what they've been doing. Look at the unified way one has been approaching the issue. Of course, one can interpret such an agreement and the, the final line in different ways, which will fit the parties. But certainly our way of looking at it is basically that uh, you, you start with uh, uh, looking at where the coasts lie, not issues of population, not socio-economic issues, and not any of those issues that the International Court of Justice has decided are not, relatively speaking, pertinent to that particular issue. Uh, what, at the end of the day, may be uh, key is, uh, in the case of Barency, is whether there is any major disparity between the coastal lengths of the parties. And Russia has longer coastlines in that area than Norway has in the southern part, which led to an adjustment of uh, the delimitation line in Russia's favor. Uh, as compared to a provisional equidistance line. While if you move further up, you will not have such disparity and you will end up with an equidistance line. So it's, it's slightly more complex than just splitting the difference. It's uh, basically trying to encapsulate what uh, kinds of developments have happened in international law, uh, knowing that at the end of the day, it's not only an issue of signing an agreement, uh, you have to sell it to your parliaments, you have to sell it to your public opinions. 
and uh, the litmus test may be nowadays, more than before, uh, what, would this, what, what might the solution have been if we'd gone to an international court? Well, you never know exactly what the uh, outcome might have been, but uh, you could rephrase and say, would, it, would, would this look very different from what an international court would have come up with? At least in Norway, in public opinion in Norway, that was a, 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 uh, a question that people were, were, were very interested in knowing more about. The other comment I'd like to make, um, and to, to both of you, uh, because I, I, I thought your, your remarks were very uh, extremely uh, um, uh, instructive and interesting, uh, is that uh, uh, parties may have uh, a choice of means when they have to deal with issues which are as complex as the ones you refer to in the Central Arctic Ocean, meaning that you have to decide on the extent of the continental shelf, um, in principle, before you, you can divide it with maritime delimitation bilaterally or trilaterally or what have you. But there are ways of um, making assessments, and I think you alluded to that, as to uh, whether the parties can roughly agree on the geological, ge the geophysical and hydrographic evidence available. And without awaiting the Continental Shelf Commission's final uh, say, and I agree it's a recommendation, it's not a judicial decision, it's a recommendation, you can basically, um, there are ways of dealing with um, uh, the, the, the future delimitation between the parties. And I'd like to highlight that uh, one of the most complex and, uh, and rewarding exercises I was engaged in was uh, actually uh, discussing uh, together with our Icelandic colleagues, uh, our Danish colleagues, and the Danes in this case were represented by both Copenhagen and the Faroes, um, as regards the division of the areas of the North Atlantic between uh, Iceland, uh, the Faroes, uh, the island of Jan Mayen, knowing that we had the judgment from the International Court of Justice referring to the way to be afforded to Jan Mayen, and mainland Norway. And what we did was to uh, adopt agreed minutes in 2006. I'm not sure everyone knows about those, but basically they uh, set up several scenarios. One scenario is that we expect that this area of overlapping claims its shelf, and the Continental Shelf Commission will confirm that, and in that case, the division will be as follows. And that was uh, adopted in uh, a way uh, that is reminiscent of the Elan declarations, if those of you know Norwegian or in history or others, so it, it basically the fact that foreign ministers and governments who engage themselves uh, unilaterally or as a group, they commit to something and it can become binding. Um, and then there was an interesting proviso that in case any of us have miscalculated or the Commission is not in agreement, we will revise the outcome of that uh, exercise. Now it's interesting to see that the Commission is broadly speaking in agreement with the parties. So there are ways of dealing with things without necessarily having to await the final outcome of a process engaged before the Continental Shelf Commission. And if you're interested in that, you can look at the toolbox and this, this particular uh, situation I referred to may be interesting. Sorry for being lengthy, but I won't speak again. Thank you. Anybody wants to reply? Yes. Just add David. one comment on the uh, Beaufort Sea. I mean, there are differences, obviously, and um, with Canada, you have actually indigenous rights issues and subsistence rights off the coast, and that's really a complicating factor because under Canadian constitution, consultation requirement goes with any kind of major impact of decisions that may impact uh, uh, Aboriginal title or rights. So that's another complicating factor. Uh, that we'll have to see how that plays out because there's a lot of politics in Canada as well. The, the Northwest Passage has largely been politics more than law. So it's been driving the whole issue in Canada for a long time, the idea of sovereignty. Harper government really went on sovereignty. Trudeau is much less on sovereignty, although it's still there. It's more on environmental protection, conservation, and he's trying to reconcile with Aboriginal people. So this is another thing to watch the present government. They're really high on reconciliation. So it really raises a very complex system. That's why I think we're a long ways yet from addressing the Beaufort Sea boundary uh, resolution. Thank you, David. Any more questions? Professor Oxman. Um, Norway, of course, is not the only state that has an Arctic coast between Russia and Canada. The, um, and I was intrigued by the references to the continental shelf of the United States, both by Professor uh, Gavriloff and by Professor van der Zwart. And I was wondering where you stood on two points, if you would comment on them. First, the International Court of Justice has indicated that it regards, in a case, that it regards paragraph one of Article 76 of the Law of the Sea Convention as declaratory of customary international law 
And I was just interested in light of your comments as to whether you personally uh, agree with that. Uh, the second is that Russia, Canada, and Norway, as parties to the Law of the Sea Convention, may not claim continental shelves beyond what is specified in paragraphs four and five of Article 76. Is it your view that the United States is similarly limited or that it can claim more because it's not a party? Who wants to take on? <laughs> well, I think, Bernie, you have the answers in your back pocket. Um, you know, I think the whole question of U.S. not being party to law of the Sea Convention, I mean, it's gone on record that a law of the convention is considered customary national law. I mean, Article 76 is really that difficult, one of the difficult positions, uh, articles most, most complicated in terms of all the questions it leaves open in terms of oceanic ridges, marine ridges, marine elevations, and they're not defined, and so all these issues are there. Uh, so I guess I'm going to go around your question a bit. I mean, I think really, the, 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 I suppose the issue for the U.S., you know, is it eventually going to become party to the convention? I mean, it's going to raise interesting questions in terms of, you know, uh, if you stay out, how do you really legitimize the claim? Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think that's really a big issue for the U.S. And, I mean, I know there's been continual push within the U.S. political system to get ratification. But, again, it seems to be it's been a, more of a Senate uh, approval problem. Uh, so maybe you might even clarify to the audience where you think the U.S. is on, or, on ratification uh, or at least acceptance of the convention. I think that's really the big issue. Uh, and then, you know, really what the status is, I mean, that's a really open question. I mean, uh, you know, U.S. staying out, it really makes it difficult to say it's customary, I think. Uh, most of the world accepts it, and it's been, we've been having the Commission on, on a Continental Shelf uh, operating, so there's an argument made that it is very much customary, I think. So, but it, it's certainly an open question and can be debated. I mean, exactly how far you want to go out. I mean, it really becomes a legitimacy question. I mean, the Law of the Sea Convention was negotiated by very powerful negotiators. And then to see a country somehow not follow through with the mechanisms that were created for countries like the United States to actually use, I mean, I think it would be very disappointing not to see it follow through. That's a personal view. Uh, I would like to see the question from the another position. Um, there are a lot of battles within the Russian Federation concerning the legal status of the Arctic. Because some of our scientists and politicals consider that the Arctic should have special legal regimes based on the historical rights, the customary international law, but not on the law of the Sea Convention. And there are two groups of peoples who fight into each other on this. I, I belong to the second one, but I think that this convention gives us special rights in respect of the Arctic because, of course, the main principles of the regulation are the same, but Arctic states has special rights concerning the regulation of the activity within the polar area. This is the first one. The second one, as you are told, the commission, uh, con convention has excluded from its scope the questions of the delimitation in the case then they deal with the opposite uh, states of adjacent states. In the case of the Arctic Ocean, it's very shallow ocean. It means that we should divide the continental shelf of this ocean between the opposite or adjacent case. That means we should do this, not commission. We should do this. Respecting to your question, it means that in respect to the United States of America, finally, we will resolve this question due to the negotiations, but with using of the customary international law, some other rules that will be applicable for this case. So it means that in this situation, we will have our own wills to come to conclusion maybe even without the using some position, some, some, some points of the law of the Sea Convention. Thank you very much. So now we have come to the stage that the panel is asking questions to the audience. <laughs> we have not had that yet. But I see that there is another question, please, uh, yes. It's a very, probably shows my ignorance. Uh, everybody is talking about continental shelf. Not one person has mentioned 
EEZ, EEZ here. Is there a reason why we haven't been talking about the Arctic EEZ at all, or the Arctic EEZ claims, or why are we just talking about Cornell Shelf and not the EEZ? That's my general question. Yeah, in terms of disputes, really the uh, disputes are mainly about legal status of Northwest Passage, boundaries, you have the Continental Shelf extension, and then eventually the boundaries. So we're talking about disputes. I mean, the, in terms of EEZs, we, we mentioned about Svalbard. There is an issue there about, you know, what is Norwegian jurisdiction over fisheries in the, outside the territorial sea. So that really wasn't a focus of the, of the presentations. So I, I think it's really a matter that that really is pretty well resolved, other than off Svalbard, which is an issue. And then we haven't really talked about the high seas either, but there is a Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, which is getting close to being negotiated, which will deal with the high seas fisheries, and in, in, includes the five coastal states, plus EU, plus China, plus Japan, plus Korea, uh, and, uh, you know, it, and, and Iceland. So, you know, we're getting close to, I think, an agreement there. We'll see if it actually does finally get negotiated later this year. But again, that's going to put a precautionary fisheries management regime in place beyond the 200-mile limits, and that's been a big issue for the Arctic as well. So we see great progress there. So I think really the EZs are pretty well settled, other than us. Well, you have the, the, the boundary is really the issue where you have your EZs extended. But it's not really an EZ issue. It's just where you draw that boundary. So it's not an ignorant question at all. Ambassador Fife? Well, I, I would say that it's pretty much settled. Uh, we have had, uh, with regard to Svalbard, a large number of court cases in Norway that ended up in the Supreme Court with no adverse reactions from anyone, because I think they pretty much represent a confirmation of full jurisdiction with regard to coastal state rights uh, around Svalbard. But I did make a reference to, to zones. I refer to the fact that when uh, Russia, or Soviet Union and Norway established 20 mile zones um, around the 1st of January 1977, we had prior to that established a fisheries cooperation pattern based on two basic treaties, which actually um, predicted necessities that would arise because of straddling stocks, codfish, haddock, etc., that would roam around and seek asylum wherever they could. And uh, what happened was uh, a beautiful architecture which basically implies that uh, the scientists meet every year, they set up their common best available scientific data and knowledge and evidence. On that basis, one negotiates and Basically, there is a system whereby you are not allowed to fish juvenile fish, undersized fish, in areas and seasons, wherever they are, where, where that would be detrimental to, to the fish stocks. So that provides an enormous amount of flexibility, irrespective of the formal um, division of waters. Uh, however, the fact that you have zones implies that the compliance has to be ensured by control mechanisms. There's no fisheries. Uh, policies or uh, resource management that is efficient unless you have enforcement at some day, at some point. And that's where zones come into play. Thank you. All right. A last attempt if there are any further questions. If not, I think we exhausted you. <laughs> we exhausted also our speakers. And I would like to end up this panel by simply uh, asking for a big hand of applause for our speakers. Thank you. And with this, uh, with this, I would then like to give the floor to uh, Sean Murphy, who will present us with a, uh, a general concluding remarks. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Eric. And uh, although Michael Wood has urged me to speak for at least an hour, uh, I'm going to instead only speak for a few minutes because I think we've been through a very rich conference over the past two days, and all of this intellectual stimulation can be quite tiring. Um, and indeed, I would say that it's actually rather hard in even, you know, 15 minutes, and I won't speak that long, but 15 minutes to, in some sense, uh, speak to everything that we talked about here, because every panel, I thought, was extremely rich in uh, the issues covered. Every panelist, I thought, was very strong in being informative and analytical. Um, and that's not true of most conferences, at least that I attend. So I think it's a real tribute to the organizers of this 
uh, conference. What I thought was interesting about the conversations yesterday and today is this idea of bringing together two fields that are viewed as somewhat discrete and separate, um, meaning international water courses and uh, the maritime spaces of the sea. And uh, this morning we started with both Marco and Marcello trying to pull together these two areas. So I thought I would spend a few minutes uh, seeing if I could tease out some of the both convergences and divergences between the two uh, areas. And I think I've identified perhaps five areas of convergences and perhaps three areas of divergences, and so I'll just quickly go through them. So the first area of convergence, I think it might have been Marcelo who mentioned this, at the highest level, we're obviously talking about two fields where water is at issue and where resources are at issue in the form of fish, in the form of possible tapping of energy, uh, in the form of uh, um, other types of uh, you know, mineral extraction, things of that sort. Um, we, when we talked about international water courses, I think we talked about it mostly in the sense of non-navigational, but obviously if you added navigation, you have for both of these areas of water resources very important rights at issue. And all of that flows into, I think, uh, the fact that there's great security interests uh, at stake here for countries, uh, whether they're thinking about resources or um, uh, navigation or other matters. I think there is a direct connection to peace and security issues that uh, one of the, the speakers mentioned. Um, and finally, at this macro level, I think you also have, obviously, uh, disputes arising among states uh, that they care deeply about because they go very much to the heart of uh, some of the passions politically that states have, but again, security interests and so on. So it's an excellent idea to think about dispute resolution in this context, and we have looked backwards at some of the disputes that have been resolved. We look at some of the disputes that exist today and we've been thinking about the disputes that might arise in the future. So clearly some convergences at the very macro level. Okay, a second general area, which I don't think we discussed as much as perhaps we should have, um, although the last panel I think started to really dig into it a bit more, and that is that most of the disputes in these two areas are resolved, if they're resolved, through negotiation. That is, I think we spent a lot of time on arbitration and a lot of time on judicial settlement. The reality is the vast majority of disputes arising in both of these areas are being, uh, if they're resolved, resolved through negotiation. So I think it's well worth lawyers and political scientists spending a lot of time thinking about when is it that states can get to a agreement? What are the factors that come into play there? And I think Professor Fischendler's uh, analysis was very interesting in that respect. You know, thinking about the risks that states have, thinking about how they try to, you know, uh, deal with those risks uh, through different techniques of allocation of resources and sometimes transfer of technologies and uh, broadening areas of cooperation. I think that is important. I think it's not just political scientists who should be thinking about this, but uh, uh, international lawyers as well. Uh, obviously, the discussion we just had about the Arctic is a, a prime place to be thinking about how do states get to yes uh, in resolving the disputes that exist. Now, I would say negotiation of disputes is obviously not unique to these two areas. So although we might say there's a convergence here, it's really a backdrop of the field of international law generally where uh, disputes will uh, invariably arise. All right, third area of convergence of a sorts is with respect to institutional structures. Uh, they do exist and are available for cooperation in both of these areas uh, where uh, we see disputes arising. If we think about it at the regional level, on the water course side of things, we talked about the Mekong, uh, the Indus, and the Nile uh, Basin uh, initiatives that exist, regional cooperation happening there. L on the law of the sea side of things, obviously the regional fisheries management organizations would be a good 
a, a template for thinking through these kinds of issues. And we probably could think more about are there crossovers between these two types of uh, regional cooperations. You see it as well at the bilateral level, although we didn't talk as much about that. I think there was a reference to something like the US-Canada Boundary uh, Commission, which has lasted for now 110 some years. Uh, we have that in the watercourse side of things, but then we also have uh, in the uh, law of the sea area, joint development zones between states as they uh, you know, approach uh, issues not by necessarily drawing a boundary, but by extracting resources, even in the absence of such a boundary. Uh, so I think it's important to recognize those types of institutional structures in both areas, but again, acknowledging it's not unique to these areas. We have regional and bilateral initiatives that exist in lots of areas of uh, international law, and the question may be more, are the particular features of these institutional structures different for these areas than what you find in other places? Okay, a fourth area uh, of perhaps convergence is if litigation occurs, uh, we certainly do see procedural elements that operate in both of these spheres. So Barcelo, I think, deviated from his normal a presentation to talk a little bit about how, you know, questions of jurisdiction and admissibility and counterclaims, provisional measures of protection and so on, uh, can be seen operating in both of these fields, counterclaims as well. Uh, we talked a bit about in the law of the sea context, uh, non-appearance and um, third party intervention. Uh, those are features you can also find in the international water courses uh, area to the extent that the, those issues are litigated. Again, though, you'd probably have to say that this is true of all disputes or many disputes in the field of international law. There's nothing unique about something like counterclaims when it comes to these fields, but it's true that you can find examples operating for these fields. If you're looking for more unique procedural elements, maybe we would gravitate towards things like the nature of evidence. Uh, the need for certain types of scientific evidence, hydrographers, uh, geographers, um, and so on for these types of disputes. Um, the nature of the evidence, the need for experts, uh, the fact that lawyers can't easily plug into some of these issues uh, if you do need uh, people uh, who are experts in environmental aspects and so on. Um, Site visits might also be an area where you would say more apt to see them here uh, than in certain other types of cases. Having said that, uh, I think it's also true in other areas that there is sometimes unique types of evidence, unique experts that are needed. If you've ever done a trade a dispute or an investment dispute even, uh, the need for uh, mathematicians and statisticians and uh, uh, sometimes even engineers, if it's an intellectual property dispute, things of that sort, uh, you'll, you'll find them there too. So you wouldn't want to view this as uh, completely unique to these, uh, these particular fields. Okay, fifth and final area of possible convergence uh, is in the area of substantive law. Substantive law. So there may be crossover principles. Uh, we talked probably a little bit more about this yesterday than today, but the idea of acting with due diligence uh, to prevent harm, I think, is something that you can see operating in some aspects, certainly in the watercourses context, but in some aspects of the environmental provisions of the Law of the Sea Convention, and certainly in some of the regional uh, uh, fisheries conventions and so on. Reasonable and equitable uh, utilization, uh, even if those exact words aren't used in both areas, I think you can see that phenomenon uh, operating when you're talking about the extraction of fishing resources of the seas or you're talking about uses of waters uh, in a water course uh, system. Ecosystem protection, likewise, you can map aspects from both uh, fields onto the other, I think. Uh, duty of cooperation certainly percolates there as well. Having said that, like with the other areas of convergence, I would say that, for me at least, um, the, even these particular substantive uh, rules or principles are ones you can see emanating from the field of international environmental law, generally, 
and to a certain extent from the entire field of international law. So the Rio Declaration and prior to that, the Stockholm Declaration, these are things that, that fed into uh, the way we thought about the Law of the Sea Convention and the Water Courses uh, Conventions uh, as well. Uh, so I think that although there are some crossovers and some aspects that may be unique to the fields, they probably do still need to be seen in the context of the broader field of international law. Okay, what about the divergences? Um, so I think there are a few here we could point to. Uh, one is to the extent that we have global treaties, certainly the ratification level in the context of law of the sea treaties seems to be much higher than global treaties relating to the international water courses. Uh, law of the sea convention, we're up around almost 170 some states. Uh, the water course conventions, whether it's the 92 or the 97 convention in the neighborhood of 40 uh, states parties. Uh, that obviously isn't the only metric you'd want to use. There are other treaties out there uh, and so on. Uh, and I think one of the interesting points that was made in the discussion of the uh, river basin uh, initiatives is the influence of the water course conventions on some of the non-binding instruments that are operating out there, that there is a little bit of a uh, alignment of what you're seeing, for instance, in the Nile Basin or in the Mekon Basin, uh, a little bit of an alignment with principles and rules operating in the uh, water course uh, treaties. Um, other area of divergence would be existence of global institutions where states can go to try to resolve their disputes. Obviously, with the law of the sea, we have uh, you know, various institutional structures uh, now that are out there at the global level, um, including things like the uh, Seabed Authority or the Commission on the Outer Limits of the Continental Shelf. Uh, you don't see that in the context of watercourse conventions. Perhaps not surprising, but uh, you know, we do uh, have some institutional structures within the context of the 1992 convention, but that was originally designed to be regional in nature, not global, even if it is now opened up uh, to other states. Um, third area of divergences, strength of compulsory dispute settlement. We spent a lot of time on dispute settlement, and certainly today talked a lot about the Law of the Sea Convention, compulsory dispute settlement. But obviously, if you look at the two fields in the Law of the Sea area, particularly with the Law of the Sea Convention, we've got some very important compulsory dispute settlement, very active uh, opportunity there, much weaker, almost non-existence in the context, context of the water course uh, conventions, which in turn leads, I think, to much more robust litigation in the context of law of the sea than what you can see with respect to um, international water courses. Uh, not to say there isn't some litigation in the latter, uh, but uh, if you were to look at the two fields, I think there's a lot more case law you can look at and, and probably expect a lot more uh, case law in the area of uh, the law of the sea than in uh, the context of international water courses. Uh, why are these divergences there? Why do we see uh, more of these things with respect to the law of the sea uh, than we are with respect to international uh, water courses? Uh, I think it's probably obvious to everybody here, but I'll go ahead and mention two things that I think are drivers. Uh, so one is the reciprocity problem or benefit. Uh, you have uh, lots of reciprocity uh, operating uh, in the context of the sea, where states uh, are often playing both offense and defense when they think about how they want to uh, gain access to resources and how they want to prevent others from gaining access to resources. Uh, that doesn't exist as readily in the context of international water courses and this is in particular the upstream downstream problem where the upstream state often is quite content to take as much resources out as possible and not to share, whereas the downstream uh, state doesn't have that, uh, that type of incentive. And so that I think creates problems for all of these areas where I, I noted the divergencies. The other is the sovereignty problem, which we've touched on. I don't know if we fully fleshed it out, but 
uh, when you're talking about international water courses, you're talking about state sovereignty, pure and simple, um, where states view these water courses as a part of their territory um, and their rights to use the water course in their view is driven by you know, their sovereignty uh, over it. Uh, in the context of the sea, uh, obviously we have what we regard as more communal spaces where uh, particularly as you get further out, uh, you may have some sovereign rights, but you don't have sovereignty, and you get even further out from that, you don't even have sovereign rights. So this need to share, I think, has resulted in much more uh, forgiving approaches in terms of developing rules and uh, willingness to engage in uh, compulsory dispute settlement. So um, with that in mind, some convergences, some divergences, I think I will end by noting, uh, as I think it was Rolf did, the photo. Uh, the photo is a great photo. Um, it's obviously a metaphor, right? The bridge is dispute resolution. The water is, you know, either the sea or the water course or so on. Um, to me, that bridge looks pretty weak. I'm not sure I'd want to walk out on that uh, bridge. And the waters, as was noted before, look very calm. <laughs> they don't look troubled at all, right? It doesn't look like a storm is coming here or anything. So I guess uh, I would say uh, something that's maybe echoing a point that Bernie Oxman made uh, about compulsory dispute settlement. He said we shouldn't take it for granted that this was a major accomplishment and we shouldn't you know, forget that and, and just assume it will always be there and, and that it was easy to achieve. Uh, I think likewise, it's probably worth us reflecting that the rules we have in both the area of water courses and uh, the law of the sea, we shouldn't take them for granted. It's been very hard to get to where we are right now, both with respect to substantive uh, rules and with respect to procedural opportunities um, such that uh, I think at the end of the day uh, we should be preparing for those waters to get much rougher in the future at times and because of that as lawyers and political scientists and so on that bridge needs to be stronger. <laughs> I'm going to fully finish by just saying on behalf of everyone here, the speakers, the chairs, the participants, how grateful we all are, as we've said on many occasions, but as the final speaker, I think I have to acknowledge it as well. Uh, great thanks to Olen and to the Institute for organizing this wonderful, uh, wonderful event to Marco and Tamar for their strong support and for all of the others that we've seen scurrying around, getting us to places on time and so on. Great thanks. Great thanks to Eric as well and to the uh, Freie Universität uh, Brussels for its uh, support of this and of course to the FNR Luxembourg, which not only kept us very well fed but well caffeinated as well. So I know you have concluded, so the usage is that nobody adds anything. But uh, I hope that now you understand why at the outset of the conference I already expressed my gratitude to the staff of the Institute who have get putting together this, this conference. They worked before, during, they will work after, and we would be nothing without them. So I, I'm very, very grateful to them. And so. Um, <laughs> And of course, I also mentioned that we owe a lot to the energy of our young researchers. And I would like also to say my best thanks and uh, on my behalf and Eric's as well and all of us to Tamar and Marco, who, who, whose energy and friendship did so much for this conference to become this uh, big success. I know they have learned a lot. It's the beginning. And because it's the beginning in the world of the uh, conference organizers, I would love them to, to keep a, a small souvenir. <laughs> you. you know, 
this kind of small item you never succeed in being rid of for the rest of your life, you know. <laughs> and so, <laughs> good luck <laughs> in, in this world. And thanks to all of you for having come to Luxembourg. We were really lucky with the weather as well, which is absolutely incredible. But uh, I hope that you will have uh, the desire to come back. Thank you very much. Thank you.